podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. We will be starting with our seminar from CASE on Going Net Zero. Very briefly, I will give an introduction what CASE is for those that are just joining and are not familiar with the organization. And then we have some amazing speakers to discuss how do we actually get to net zero. We've heard a lot about goals and how to be carbon neutral, but how do we actually get there? Um, a reminder, as you're joining, please uh, keep your speaker on mute so that there's not much of a noise in the background. And you're always welcome to put your questions in the chat. Uh, we will be addressing them as we go. The plan is that we will cover uh, the, the discussion with the, the panelists for about uh, 40, 50 minutes, and then we'll have about 20 minutes time for the audience. So again, welcome everyone. Um, this is a seminar through CASE. For those that don't know, CASE is the Center for Advanced Energy Studies, and it is a consortium consisting of Idaho National Laboratory, Public Research Universities in Idaho, Boise State University, Idaho State, and University of Idaho. And it focuses on research, education, and innovation. The center is committed to cutting edge research and to educating new generations of scientists. And together, the case entities comprise 8,000 researchers, university fa faculty engineers, more than 65,000 students, nearly 100 laboratories and engineering facilities, and at least 1,000 100 academic degrees and certificates. CASE leverages all those resources to empower the students, researchers, and faculty, and to accelerate energy solutions. As part of the consortium, we have the CASE Currents series. Um, I will be leading this discussion. My name is Veronica Vajnik, and I'm currently in a fellowship that is actually organized through the center um, at the Idaho Governor's Office working on energy policy. This seminar is held in response to global events like climate change, change and climate crisis, and it is a forum for us to gain insight to the event and discuss, discuss the opportunities and solutions to this big problem. It is formatted as a panel discussion, and it is comprised of experts from across the board. You will see that we have both CASE institutions represented like the Idaho National Lab, but also many institutions outside of the network. The audience participation is key, so please remember that you will have an opportunity to ask questions in the chat. Please feel free to type it at any time. Just as a reminder for maybe those that are outside of the system of CASE, we are uh, collecting ideas for how INL can go to net zero uh, through the case annual pitch event 2021. So if you are an employee or enrolled in one of the Idaho uh, universities, you can submit your ideas as part of the different tracks towards demonstration projects implement today and open submission with $90,000 program development funds for your ideas to come to the next level. If you would like to learn more, <clears throat> you're most welcome to go to the website of case and look up the information about the pitch event. Now, now that I have given you the normal spiel about CASE, finally we're back to what does it actually take to go to net zero? Um, and I will slowly um, stop sharing my screen so that you can focus on our speakers because that's who will, will be um, participating most today. And we have some excellent experts that can help us understand how do we actually reach net zero carbon goals. The recent BP report said that so many companies started committing to net zero goals that about 70% of global emissions are covered by net zero pledges. That's a wonderful, how do we actually get there? And that's what I hope that we will be discussing today and that one of the conclusions that we hopefully will find today. So today um, we are joined by Priya Barra from Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, REBA. She is the director of Zero Carbon Innovation and she has expertise in emissions and attribute accounting, utility business models, regulatory frameworks, and corporate energy buying strategies. Before joining REBA, she worked at the World Resources Institute, the World Bank, the ICF International, supporting the Energy Star Energy Efficiency Program, and at the IHS Emergency, Emerging Energy Research. 
Priya holds a master degree in public policy degree from Harvard Kennedy School and a bachelor's degree from Brandeis University. Welcome Priya. Next up, we have Dr. Todd Combs. Um, he very kindly agreed to participate, um, stepping in for John Wagner, who unfortunately had a conflict that, that arose. Todd Combs is the Associate Laboratory Director at INL at Idaho National Lab and is the interim laboratories lead for the Net Zero program. Before joining INL, he served as the Director of Global Science Division at Argonne National Lab and as Argonne's Interim Associate Laboratory Director for Energy and Global Security. A retired colonel in the US Air Force Reserve, his military experience includes assignments at the Air Force Research Laboratory, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and the Air Force Studies and Analysis Agency. Todd earned his doctorate in operations research Sorry, I am impartial. That's my minor for PhD uh, and master's degree in operations analysis from the Air Force Institute of Technology and is a graduate of the <clears throat> U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Welcome, Todd. Next up, we have Dr. John Kreitz. He is the managing director at RMI, formerly Rocky Mountain Institute. For those that are confused that it's an abbreviation, there was a rebranding as far as understood, so it's RMI now. <laughs> and he co-leads overall program activity and is personally responsible for RMI Ventures, a global collaboration focused on accelerating early stage climate solutions. In his time with RMI, he initiated the Reinventing Fire China collaboration working alongside some of the China's most senior energy leaders to craft a clean energy roadmap for the country. Prior to joining RMI, John was a partner with McKinsey and Company for 11 years, where he helped found McKinsey sustainability practice and was a member of the global energy practice. Before McKinsey, John worked as a designer for both aerospace and power industries. John holds a PhD and master in mechanical engineering from University of California, Berkeley, and a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome, John. Next up, and yes, my speakers really didn't make it easy. They just have so many very, very cool things in their biographies. Um, David Eichberg from HP, um, is the global head of climate strategy. He oversees HP's climate strategy, sustainability goals and metrics, and ESG, ESG, ah, ESG assessments. David has led programs from communication, social investment, technology, and thought leadership showcases, sustainability valuation, and strategic collaboration with nonprofit and NGO partners. Previously, David worked at Business for Social Responsibility, Applied Communications and the U.S. Congress Office of Technology Assessment. David holds a master's degree in public and international affairs from the University of Pittsburgh and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of California, Berkeley. So we have some people from um, California. Woohoo! <laughs> and last but not least, we have Stephanie Krentz from the Nez Perce Tribe. She is an ecologist who works on climate change adaptation planning for the Nez Perce Tribe. Her background includes working for public, private, and nonprofit entities, conducting scientific research, plant and animal surveys, and planning to protect biological diversity, endangered species, and human health and well being. She received her master's degree from the University of Michigan, where her research focus was on ecology and biological diversity in agricultural ecosystems. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you so much for being here, and let's dive right in. Um, I just would like to ask a question to all of you. How does your organization and you personally relate to net zero goals? So why do we even care about this issue? And let's start with Priya. Thank you, Veronica. So I, I guess um, what I, you know, I'll start with why do we care? So according to the Energy Information Agency, uh, commercial and industrial energy users are the number one cause of energy related greenhouse gas emissions in the US. So emitting two and a quarter billion tons of GHGs from their energy use alone in 2018. So it's important for CNI customers and other large energy consumers to really lead the way in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And REBA, um, the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, or REBA as we like to call it, the, our vision is a simple, simple one, a, a resilient zero carbon energy system where every organization has a viable, expedient, and cost-effective 
pathway to renewable energy procurement. Um, we are a membership association bringing together the largest group of clean energy buyers in the United States, along with their energy supply partners, other industry service providers, and energy-focused NGOs, who really together were trying to unlock the marketplace for energy consumers to lead a rapid transition to a cleaner, prosperous, zero-carbon energy future. So we currently have um, over 240 members who participate in the community. And this community has been involved in more than 95% of all corporate renewable energy transactions in the US. Um, so we really strongly believe that the energy consumers have the buying power, buy, buying power and collective voice to change markets. And they play a unique critical role in driving that zero carbon energy future. So, you know, we well, there are a few ways in which we help to support um, our members, you know, by sharing and amplifying successes and best practices, bringing market stakeholders together to really innovate and solve the toughest barriers to, to unlocking clean energy markets and accelerating their ability to achieve their clean energy goals through educational resources. So not all REBA um, buyer members have net zero goals, but there are many that do. And our key goal is really to support all members on their clean energy journeys, regardless of their starting point. Um, however, what we have observed in the community is that once a buyer has taken action to achieve their goals, they tend to expand their goals to drive more material impact through their actions. So, um, so this is an important um, place for us, and and we definitely think that you know this is in order to drive to our vision. Um, this is an important um, discussion to have. So, so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Priya. What about you, Todd? What What is um, net zero to your organization and to you? How do you relate? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple angles to it. The, the first one is that we produce a lot of carbon around here. We have a 890 square mile site, uh, both out on the desert and in town, that produces annually about 74,000 metric tons of carbon. Um, in scope one area where we actually uh, have a, a lot of control over it, we're approaching 20,000 metric tons. In scope two, where we're purchasing electricity, we're, we're in the range of 47,000 metric tons. And, and then scope three, where it's not directly related to our work, but certainly indirectly with business travel, uh, personal vehicles driving to campus and everything else, we're, we're looking at 22,000 metric tons of carbon. So. You're talking the equivalent of about 170,000 barrels of oil, 8.3 million gallons of gasoline uh, burned annually, uh, around uh, 16,000 equivalent vehicles being operated per year. That, that's a lot of carbon that we're, we're producing as a laboratory. So that's uh, one re reason we certainly are interested in net zero. And uh, the second reason is we're a DOE uh, energy laboratory, national laboratory. So it's it's really core to our mission to develop clean energy technology that can help the country um, meet its net zero energy goals. And, and uh, on top of that, part of our vision and mission is to change the world's energy future. So what better way to do that than to do it home and reducing our, our own emissions, showing others how to do it, and then doing the deployment, the development deployment, and then transition through the re throughout the rest of the country to make it happen. So. We're excited about uh, this new net zero program that we started in late April. Uh, Dr. Wagner, our lab director, announced to the lab that he wanted to take the laboratory net zero in a decade. Uh, we realize this is an aggressive goal. There's, there's certainly a lot of work to do, but uh, the great thing is, is we, we have the technology we're developing ourselves, technology we can use from industry, as well as all of our partners across the laboratory complex to make it happen. So. So I think that's that's a gist of it from our end. Thank you, Todd. Excellent. What about you, John? Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone, uh, and thank you, Veronica, for the invitation today. Just delighted to join the panelists here. Um, so, as as Veronica mentioned, I'm from Rocky Mountain Institute, or now RMI, as we've been rebranded. Um, we're an independent nonprofit, 501c3. Um, whose mission really is to transform the global energy system to secure a clean, prosperous, and zero carbon future for all. So, so kind of net zero is in our mission. It is what we do here globally. Um, many of you probably 
recognize RMI over the years from Amory and, you know, uh, very early days of the first oil crisis, you know, kind of really preaching. And I use that word specifically because that's what Amory does, um, uh, you know, about the, the need to align overall our, uh, our total energy system with energy efficiency and renewables and a net zero vision. Um, a couple of years ago, we recognized very clearly that the planet isn't on track and we doubled, redoubled all of our efforts across our entire portfolio. Um, and, and RMI is a, a special organization. We're, we're market led and business driven, but we're a 501c3 nonprofit. So we kind of play as a, a, a special acupuncture agent or a catalyst in the middle of markets, governments, and NGO actors to try and, and stimulate growth. Um, uh, you know, we have realigned our entire portfolio to be focused, and now we have nearly 500 people that are focused on achieving uh, full climate alignment in areas like deep, deep decarbonization of, of industry and the electricity sector and the built environment and mobility, so the kind of the core infrastructure spaces, but also on um, using kind of cross-cutting global catalysts like climate intelligence and how we increase the visibility of data and get to real-time uh, carbon emission accounting, how exactly we build out global finance capability and flows to support uh, the necessary and rapid transition, um, how exactly we, we spur forward breakthrough technologies and how also we, we kind of build up and, and uh, develop the next generation of uh, energy leaders, particularly in low and middle income uh, countries and communities. These are all different aspects of what it is we do. And, and our goal in the end is to drive for full climate alignment. And for us, as we think about uh, net zero, it's an important, but not as, I will also say not a sufficient, and we'll talk about that here in a little while. It's an important, but not a, not a sufficient mile marker in achieving that full climate alignment. So again, delighted to be here, Veronica. Thank you very much, John. Well, next to David, what, um, how do you relate to Net Zero and how does your organization relate to it? Thanks, Veronica, and thank you again to CAES um, to, to participate today. A lot of a great panelists. I'm really excited to share and learn from everyone here. So, um, you know, climate action isn't something that's new to HP. We were the first global IT company to, um, to measure and re publicly report our full entire footprint across supply chain operations and our products and solutions. We've set carbon reduction goals across all three of those spaces. And again, first to do that, we actually set and met a first generation of science-based targets, moving on to the next ones as well. But as our company was really looking, not just from sustainability, but the, the whole business at a 2030 vision, a 2030 agenda, net zero and what it means to our company really fit in as part of that 2030 agenda for our sustainable impact strategy, our sustainability strategy, right alongside um, what else was core to our company, which was you know build literally building a pyramid of culture and talent, our portfolio, our financials, sustainable impact was a central part, an explicit part of that pillar. And over the past three months, HP has announced bold and aggressive climate action targets, some of the most robust human rights goals, and committed to accelerate digital equity for 150 million people in this decade. Our ambition is to become the world's most sustainable and just technology company. And that 2030 agenda is designed to propel us forward and to prioritize the efforts where our technology and our talent and our ecosystem partners and suppliers and customers can have the greatest impact. In climate, this spring, we announced a series of, of goals that we believe are among the most aggressive and comprehensive in the technology industry. Um, we announced that we're going to achieve um, net zero across our entire value chain, scopes one, two, and three by 2040. Um, and we're gonna begin by bringing parts of our business into carbon neutrality as we go along, our operations, our print supplies business, for example. We also know that we have to have interim goals. We committed to reducing our value chain GHG emissions 50% by 2030 compared to 2019. So we're very much looking in lines of having our, uh, our carbon emissions in the same way that we've heard from IPCC that we need to do that by the end of this decade. And why is this, you know, what was important to us as we looked at doing this was 
number one, to align to the science. We are a, we are a technology company and very much looking to what is it that, that we're going to need to do and how do we root that against the best practice and the best science out there. Uh, we wanted to be look long term, but also establish those interim targets so that we can drive action now in the organization, not just look down the road, but also recognize from a lot of external stakeholders that there's an expectation to be setting interim targets and demonstrating that progress. We wanted to maintain a mantle of leadership, as I mentioned at the outset, that we've held a long time, but frankly, this is a fast moving space, particularly in our industry. Everyone seems to be wanting to do more and faster. Um, so our leadership said, you know, demonstrate significant ambition, be bold. Um, we wanted to leverage and accelerate a number of other very important strategies in our company, whether there is sustainability, such as a drive to a more circular economy, how does that support our net zero goal, and how do key parts of our business strategies, such as moving to more as a service model from just transactional models. And lastly, it's very, very important for us to move in and embrace net zero because we wanted to meet and even exceed the expectations of investors and customers and frankly, even employees. A number of our largest investors ask us to report every year to CDP, the Climate Disclosure Project. Um, and sustainability is increasingly an important driver in customer purchasing decisions. We saw over a billion dollars in new sales wins last year alone. That was the second year in a row uh, of deals tied to sustainability attributes, including climate. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing, David. And last but not least, Stephanie, how do the tribes relate to the net zero goals? Thank you, Veronica. And um, all my fellow panelists for everything that you've said. It's really inspiring to hear what everyone is doing. Um, you know, I work for the Nez Perce tribe and there are five tribes in Idaho. And if you think about this, you know, the Nez Perce tribe is on this journey of solarizing their facilities and developing a net zero plan. We're not a international business organization or a research institute. And I think the more interesting, the most interesting part of the story of this journey is not how that they're how they're doing it, it's why. So as many of you know, the tribes in the Columbia River Basin are salmon tribes. That is the thing that they care about the most in many cases. I mean, obviously people here care about gathering, fishing, and hunting. They have seen impacts to every natural system that they evolved alongside. It's not as if the tribes in this region haven't faced dramatic changes in the climate before they have. They were here during the Pleistocene. They have oral histories about the Bonneville floods and the Missoula floods. And, you know, during that time, the fish came inland and filled the rivers. The Snake River salmon run was the largest salmon run in the world. Not only are these fish now endangered, they are extremely climate vulnerable. The, you know, fishery scientists throughout the entire West have studied the climate vulnerability of all of the species in the California current. And the species that come here to the homelands of the Nez Perce tribe are all highly um, endangered because of climate change. So when we think about net zero here, it's not about how we're going to cancel out our carbon emissions. You know, the tribe is land rich. They already have a huge solar project going. I think they can meet their net zero goals very quickly. It's about how we're gonna get back down to a level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that sustains the species that they care about the most and ultimately means cultural survival for the tribe. And that includes salmon and choke cherries and many gathered plants. It includes wild game. The projections that we're looking at here are so dramatic and so terrifying. The data is so clear. You know, we just had a historic heat wave 
there are literally fish cooking in the rivers and shellfish cooking on the shorelines. People here are scared. And one of the most important things I think for any net zero journey is the technology is available to do this very, very rapidly. What is missing is the societal and political will. Tribes in the United States and around the world are determined to save their way of life. And the Nez Perce tribe is no exception to that. And so the how for them is they're gonna get it done. It's the why that matters. And it's bringing other people along on this journey, not to just meet their sustainability goals or level out the amount of carbon, but to do it rapidly enough that these fish have a fighting chance to survive the bottleneck that's coming because of climate change. And I think that perspective is so unique and so precious and so needed. And so, you know, the Nespers tribe is a business. It's the lar one of the largest employers in the LC Valley. It has enterprises that are impacted by climate change in every way possible, whether it's ag or tourism or any of the many other things that the tribe does. But the overarching goal is to save salmon. And everything that they do and the energy, you know, decisions that they make moving forward relates to that goal. So thank you. It's an honor to be here and to represent the tribe and I hope I do it well. And it's an honor to be with all of you, some of my heroes, to hear about your journeys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That is indeed a very unique perspective. And as we're talking about net zero, I think before we kind of dive deep into the details, um, let's just try to establish a common ground. And I have a question to all of you. What does net zero mean to you? What is that term? And let's maybe start with Todd. Yeah, so um, we actually talked about this as we as we talked um, talked about it as lab when we were getting started in, in April. But because we talked about carbon neutrality at first, and then and then we started moving closer pretty quickly to net zero. So so really, it's it's about actively and aggressively doing our part to combat the climate crisis. Um, and I mean, bottom line is for the things we control, especially stop producing carbon and flat out stop producing it uh, and then and then move beyond that in terms of developing clean energy solutions. Uh, we see it ultimately, if we're gonna meet our goals, we really wanna become a carbon sink so that we're taking carbon dioxide and going and doing value added things with it, producing fuels, chemicals, other things, taking it out of the environment um, uh, so that uh, everything as a whole can, can improve. So, so it's really for us, it's about stop producing carbon, especially in the in the scope one, scope two areas. Uh, it's about we need to walk the talk. So we're a clean energy lab. Um, we we are developing solutions that we want others to use. So it's about time we start aggressively implementing them ourselves and, and getting towards our net zero goals. And then the other thing is um, there's really a symbiotic relationship in terms of moving towards net zero will will be great in terms of um informing uniform uni, unifying our clean energy programs uh and the development and demonstration programs that we're going to need to really as a country drive forward uh, with net zero wonderful thank you todd john what, what about your definition of net zero what does that what does that mean to you yeah, I think net zero is an important concept. And there, there is, you know, as this whole movement has, has kind of uh, garnered strength here over the last few years, different definitions have emerged. And right now there's a, a, a you know, kind of a desire and a, a need to more robustly define net zero. Um, and indeed, the science-based targets initiative, et cetera, are working to try and create those standards that everyone can comply with. But, but at least from my perspective, net zero is, it's the highest level of stewardship that a company can offer, right? It is, uh, you know, when people talk about carbon neutrality, oftentimes it's, 
It allows for offsetting your emissions elsewhere through purchase uh, offsets that are, aren't directly within your supply chain, aren't directly within your operations. But when a company makes a commitment to net zero, um, that commitment generally does cover scope one, scope two, and scope three in the technical term, right? Um, but it, it specifically is in areas of, of, of control and management of that company. Now, net zero is important, as I, as I indicated earlier, but it's not sufficient. And, and the thing to keep in mind here right now is that to achieve a one and a half degree pathway, and, and you know, frankly, the, what happens if we exceed one and a half degrees isn't, um, it isn't nice, you know, that from a, a scientific perspective at two degrees, we lose all coral reefs globally. At two degrees, we have uh, 600 million people that are additionally in stressed water regions that are going to have to migrate and, and work someplace else. Else, At two degrees, most of India can't work outside through the middle of the day. These are not acceptable outcomes. And so we have to absolutely strive for that one and a half degree pathway. And that one and a half degree pathway, when you do the math, means we need to cut our emissions this decade by 50% globally. And right now we're not cutting anything where individual companies are cutting, but globally we're growing still. So we've got to completely reverse and cut in half our entire global emissions base here over the next eight years. That is uh, the, the challenge here. And, and so I'd like us all to maintain a focus, not just on net zero, which is an important commitment, but a net zero with the purpose of climate alignment, which means 50% reductions here over the next uh, eight years. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, John. Yeah, that, that is a very good reminder about the scale and the, the speed that we need to be moving. So Stephanie, what about you? What, what does net zero mean to you and the tribes? You know, this is a really interesting sort of philosophical question, right? Like, if you really study the technology and all of the things that can be done. So, you know, for instance, the tribe is a large landowner. They can work with producers that lease their land to sequester a huge amount of carbon. They can restore forests, and they're already doing those kinds of projects. They can restore wetlands. They can, you know, reduce their waste stream and make sure that there's no food waste going into landfills and producing methane. They can produce all of their own energy and try to push the energy market in the local economies. There are so many ways that they could meet these kinds of goals, but almost all of these things relate to their values. So, you know, part of it is human health. Obviously, we're in the middle of a human health crisis right now. We're having these terrible smoke events. We have a lot of people with asthma and COPD and diabetes that are really vulnerable in these events. And, you know, the housing that people live in is not necessarily energy efficient, green, sustainable, or comfortable in these kinds of events. So there's this social and human aspect to it. Um, I mean, there are so many different ways to look at this problem, but if you think about it, looking at the global climate system for all time, human beings really have a chance now to engineer a stable future or to allow a runaway climate scenario that leads to having the climate of the dinosaurs in less than 80 years. You know, if you look at Pacific salmon, they evolved. They're only 6 million years old. Bull trout are a million years old. They evolved in a really cold period of Earth's climate. I mean, obviously, lamprey and sturgeon and these other fish that tribal members still eat that are still part of their table and their ceremonies are, you know, hundreds of millions of years old. Um, but Pacific salmon and bull trout are young in the evolutionary history of our planet. And they evolved at about 450 parts per million. I mean, we've mapped out the projection of, you know, business as usual or the best case scenario of RCP 4.5. And 
you know, those scenarios, the way they are today, are not acceptable. Looking at five to 600 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by 20, 30 or 40, 1200 parts per million by 2100. And that is an unthinkable scenario. It's, it's an extinction of everything that they hold dear. And, and so, you know, net zero means returning to a climate that is recognizable to the species that call this place home and to the culture that's based upon this land, I think, for this tribe and for many tribes around the country and across the world. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephanie. And Priya, what does net zero mean to you? Well, I think a lot of the panelists already touched on on a lot of the points. I think, you know, very simplistically, it's, you know, means emitting no more greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere than are permanently removed from it um, to me. So, you know, I really think about it as a target or strategy that can be adopted kind of at an organizational level, at an economy level. Ultimately, we need it at the global level. Um, and if successful, you know, it would limit global warming and, um, you know, the, these impacts um, from climate change. So, so I think, you know, just kind of in a nutshell, that's what net zero means to me is, is really having a strategy that helps us um, limit um, you know, the um, limit global warming um, in, in a way, you know, as quickly and efficiently as, as possible. It's kind of a, a strategy to, to get there. Absolutely. Thank you, Priya. Um, I think we may have lost for a second, David. So I will just move on to the next question and hope that uh, we will manage to get reconnected. But I just wanted to discuss, well, there's definitely this sense of urgency around carbon and climate change, but there are so many other challenges like the plastic pollution, the air pollution, the loss of biodiversity. So I just wanted to see why are we talking about net zero carbon goals? Why are we not having the same sense of um, rush from companies to sign up for net zero waste or maybe net zero pollution. And I just wanted to uh, um, see what Priya and John, you think on, the, on that matter. Sure, I can, I can dive in first. Um, I think so, so net zero again is, is, you know, I see it as kind of an, a, a holistic approach to addressing greenhouse gas emissions and therefore climate change. Um, and I think there's two key points that I'd like to raise here. Um, you know, the first one is, I think, and again, as the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, we've seen one of the key emerging trends um, that we've witnessed in the corporate sector since 2019 is that many companies are shifting focus from purely deploying additional renewable energy towards the end game outcome of a decarbonized grid through carbon focused goals. Um, so, you know, we see a focus on true kind of zero carbon solutions um, as part of that, where companies are focused on matching procurement, um, of clean energy to time of use and location and citing projects as well where the potential for emissions reductions is highest. Um, and at the same time, you know, a lot of companies are looking to have greater positive impact through their procurement, um, even beyond carbon, you know, seeking opportunities for additional benefits such as job creation and alignment and kind of impact on, on the communities. Um, and so I think it's, you know, essentially more and more end users see, see renewables and kind of the, the strategy as a means to an end and not an end in itself. Um, so I think that's one trend that, that we've definitely seen. Um, the second is that as more and more companies start thinking more holistically about their scopes one, two and three emissions to meet net zero um, carbon goals, Many are also setting supply chain emission reduction goals and engaging with their suppliers to try to achieve them. Um, you know, I know that CDP supply chain program when it started in 2009 had only 10 companies asking their suppliers to report greenhouse gas emissions. And today they're almost 150 companies asking over 15,000 suppliers to report. Um, and so again, you know, that is like, you know, they're, they're even, as a result, there are even more organizations that go into the transparency stage um, of the buyer's journey, which is in some ways, as I, I said before, kind of the first step um, to getting to action. I think 
I think the key point is really that more companies are, are doubling down um, to ensure that their clean energy ambitions truly drive decarbonization of, of our power system, um, which is collective action that benefits all customers, um, you know, all consumers, including including suppliers. Um, and, and partners. Um, and so, you know, I think that's why setting that zero carbon goals really helps to, to drive towards that. And, and as I said before, I mean, it, it is really a way to um, one, one strategy for, for addressing climate change. Yeah, and, and from my perspective, you know, I know there are lots of issues out there in the world. Um, and certainly in the midst of a global pandemic that has really become the crisis of the moment, it is hard to think more broadly um, about other issues, but but I will say where that is the defining crisis of the moment, I think climate change is the defining crisis of our generation, right? And we simply have to come into balance and find the way to manage the overall climate carbon pollution we're putting in the air and to decouple our industrial system, our economic system, um, and use that as a as a, an op as a possibility, I would say as well, to create a structure that is much more equitable, that um, allows for growth globally um, with fewer constraints than what we see right now. And so, you know, we've talked a lot about the challenge and the, the devastation that could, that comes from uh, not achieving climate alignment. But on the other side, there's a lot of hope and possibility if we are able to get there quickly. We're talking about creating new economies that are two to $3 trillion of investment every year that could be spread much more democratically globally. Um, we can preserve and improve, uh, you know, kind of what's best in the environment. Um, we can, uh, you know, work to uh, solve urban problems uh, and connect social fabrics in different ways if we, ad if we address this problem in the right way. And I think part of why, um, you know, and you heard this, uh, you know, kind of earlier from, from David as he explained a bit of HP's motivation, but, but why companies are involved in prioritizing climate is, is because of this possibility to be part of that transformation, right? It is part to help lead toward, you know, a, a future of possibility. And, you know, it does have elements of, of certainly having a, uh, you know, kind of ensuring that the social compact that they have as a license to operate is preserved. Um, but but I see more companies moving toward it because it's the right thing to do. They, you know, it's the right way to motivate your team. It's the right way to, to build new businesses for the future that needs all of these solutions going forward. There are, so plastics are important, you know, kind of, um, uh, Lots of other environmental issues are important, but this is the one that we have to solve and that can solve many other issues simultaneously. So I think that's, at least for me, what, what kind of brings my energy into the, into the conversation and, and really uh, helps my institution, you know, kind of focus uh, diligently on the possibilities here. Thank you, John and Priya. You mentioned um, how David was was describing the emissions, but also equity goals. And David, would you like to address more how your company is working towards net zero, but also addressing other goals and challenges like equity and waste and biodiversity? Sure. So sorry about the connection there. Kind of ironic, right? That the the, the, the IT company has the is the internet trouble there all of a sudden. So um, hopefully this, this will keep up. So it's now I'll blame the uh, I'll blame the cellular service if I run into trouble now. Um, so, uh, and I appreciate John's comments. I mean, I think they're, they're they're very spot on. I mean, companies really looking at this from certainly from a way to manage the risk and the risks that are coming to to the business and business operations in a number of different ways. And what Stephanie spoke with in, in terms of thinking about sustainability of, you know, of of culture and underpinnings of livelihoods, you know, those those exist in very different ways, whether it's across communities and business. But we also are really looking at it as a ways that, that we can drive innovation and have opportunity in that transition that we see happening. But we know we have to be an engine for that. And we have to bring a lot of others along. 
Um, so the thought about, you know, beyond net zero, we approach climate very holistically and, and we came out with this, these recent set of goals because we want to look at it from a number of angles. Um, you know, we have a climate action goals that have three parts to them. I mentioned that we're reducing carbon emissions. Those are obviously the driver of climate change. We're also increasing circularity so that we can reduce the consumption of resources that drive carbon emissions through all of that sourcing and production. And third, in protecting and restoring and responsibly managing um, ecosystems, particularly forests, that sequester carbon and can help to mitigate climate change and, and support ecosystems, biodiversity, local livelihoods, wildlife habitat, and the like. Um, so we've also set forth a goal that we want to—it's a—it's a goal. We think about circularity, you know, and um, we want to move from being that take, make, use, and dispose model to keeping products and the materials in their highest state of use for as long as possible, including extending the life of that product and even giving those products multiple lives. So we have a goal to drive 75% circularity in our products and packaging by 2030. That means that 75% of all the, all the annual materials that go into our product and packaging will come from either reused, renewable or recyclable materials, products or parts. We're, we've also already eliminated deforestation in the sourcing of all of HP's paper. And now 99%, I guess I'm, I'm supposed to say, of all of our paper-based packaging, I'm resolving our, you know, the final 1% through due diligence work. Um, but we're going beyond that now. We recognize that as a printing company, people don't use HP paper to print. As a matter of fact, only a fraction of that is. But we want to make people feel that we are taking, we're playing a role in counteracting deforestation for all HP, all paper, HP or non-HP that's used in our products and our print services. And that's going to involve investing in protecting and restoring forests around the world. And I wouldn't want, I'd be remiss not to mention water. It's a goal we've already had in place for a while, but people say, you know, if climate change, I've heard it said, if climate change is a shark, then the water impacts are going to be the teeth. And again, we think about the impact of what's happening to, to, to salmon and the stress on that population, and we're seeing that already. Um, we're committed to reducing potable water withdrawal in our operations by 35% by 2025 um, compared to 2015, but, it, but significantly with a focus on the high risk sites because the, we really need to know where we need to apply our energies and our efforts if we're truly going to make a difference in whether it's how we source, produce, or consume and the emissions that are associated with that. Thank you, David, for the overview and, and kind of broadening the impact that you're focused on. And I guess if we continue with this theme, a lot of the mentions about decarbonization is around energy, but is it really, is net zero only about energy? So I just wanted to ask Stephanie, how do you think, um, can you include land use and waste construction, scope three emissions? And for our audience, scope three um, is one of the types of carbon emissions emissions are usually separated into scope one, two, and three, depending on how close to the impact you are from your own production. So Stephanie, how do you plan to include other factors beyond energy? Um, so there's ways that the tribe is already doing that, um, especially with recycling. You know, there isn't, we're a very remote rural community and it's difficult to have access to good recycling facilities, but we have an incredibly determined solid waste program in the water resources division that's doing incredibly creative things when it comes to recycling. Um, during the pandemic, all of the local agencies stopped recycling. They just built up raw materials that they couldn't offload. So we collected and stored as much recycling as we possibly could, and then are looking in ways to recycle and reuse it ourselves locally. Um, we're looking into different ways to compost. You know, the tribe has a number of waste streams. You know, you wouldn't necessarily think about a tribe as having this, but they have fish hatcheries, forestry operations, um, restaurants, and you know, grass clippings. So looking at ways to make sure that those things are turned into soil and used for 
um, sequestering carbon versus becoming part of a landfill and putting carbon into the atmosphere or greenhouse gases. Um, this Climate Smart Agriculture project that we're working at, working on, you know, the tribe has something like 35,000 acres of land in agricultural production. Almost all of that land is leased. And so we're trying to increase the capacity of farmers to um, have good soil health, not only as a way to sequester carbon, but for their bottom line, for water storage. I mean, obviously, you know, no summer could be a better example of this than this summer. When you have a lot of ag fields with very short rooted crops, you're not really storing water across the landscape and that makes you more um, drought vulnerable and flood vulnerable. So looking at the quality of the soil, the carbon content of the soil, how we can increase that, how we can increase biodiversity underground and groundwater recharge is really important. We have a wetlands program where, and a watershed program where people are restoring wetlands and riparian ecosystems. Wetlands store an inordinate amount of carbon and are incredibly important for um, mitigating some of the impacts to salmonids and to water quality. So there's all of these different types of things that people are thinking about from, you know, not purchasing the products that have to be thrown away in the first place to having a virtuous cycle of consuming and giving back to the land, which is part of the value system of the tribe. And it's an ancient system of reciprocity. I mean, I don't think that there's really a more eloquent way to put this than the way that my coworker put this. You know, so much of what the tribe is doing when it comes to climate change mitigation is about restoring relationships, resiliency, reciprocity, ecosystems. It's about renewal and reparations. So, you know, the type of housing that people live in is an ecological justice issue, but it's also an incredible opportunity to create safe, healthy homes that do not burn down when there's a forest fire and are not in a floodplain. Almost all of the infrastructure that the tribe owns is in a floodplain and is therefore highly climate vulnerable. So analyzing what can be done when you have to change you know, it just opens up a world of possibilities for how to create the kind of world that we all want to live in and live our values. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And what about you, Todd? Yes, INL is an energy laboratory, but how do you think of addressing the net zero strategy beyond energy? Well, actually, to be to be truthful, we can't just just for our net zero uh, internal program, we can't ignore things like waste. Um, it's actually, uh, I didn't realize it, but we have our own landfill. Uh, and of those 70,000 plus um, metric tons, 6,000 metric tons are produced by that landfill. Uh, we, we have big cafeterias and like, so we're putting waste in, in there um, daily. So, so one of the things, thinking about right now immediately is okay how, how are we going to treat waste in the future and uh how do how do we produce less to put in the landfill as well as uh going out to the landfill capturing what's being emitted and doing something with it like i said before in terms of producing value-added uh products to eventually um, get that landfill to the point of not producing uh any emissions the um our, our fo focus initially is really on the scope one and two emissions because they're the ones we most closely um, sort of have control of, but we certainly are continuing to look at uh, scope three considerations as well. The nice thing is as we address some scope one and two issues, they, they fall into scope three sort of dependency. So 
reducing electricity purchases and getting that clean will help with reducing shares of transmission and distribution losses, which uh, get into scope three uh, type emissions. The other thing is, it's things like um, business travel. So we, we're in this COVID period. We, we have not been able to travel. We haven't been allowed to travel for, for months, for over a year. Um, and we've seen that because of that, over the year, we've been able to reduce our emissions due to business travel quite a bit. So in the future, in terms of scope three, uh, we'll certainly policy-wise look at um, that issue as well. Are we, are we gonna travel at the rates we, we used to? I mean, I know me personally, I, I will look at um, my business travel schedule and, and question, hey, do I really need to go on this trip and, and produce the emissions that, that they'll, they'll come? I think the good, the good thing is, is that on the R&D side, DOE is gonna start getting into uh, producing flute, clean aviation fuels and the like. So down the line overall, that's gonna help uh, the airline industry produce less carbon and like, and that will, will roll into helping us reduce um, in scope three as well. Um, and then, and then the, the other nice sort of uh, spillover is as we as a lab uh, help reduce scope two, that'll spill over to employees because they're pur purchasing electricity from the same places that we are. So if we get our providers clean, then our, then our at home, our, our workers will have clean clean energy as well. So there's the energy aspect. And then, and certainly we, we have to address waste and other things. And, and as you know, from an R&D perspective, um, we have a big biomass program uh, to, to, on the feedstock side, uh, really opti optimize taking things out of the field and then, and then produce biofuels and like, but that's really transforming and morphing the things like municipal solid waste. So so the same researchers who are doing the biowork are now working on things like MSW to, to take MSW and then produce feedstocks, which then go into to capturing that waste, not putting it in a landfill and producing value added products out of it. Um, so, so that's another angle. And then of course we have our critical materials work. So all sorts of electronics, the, our computer screens and the like, pl plenty of, uh, critical materials, rare earths, and everything in there uh, that we, we know are really environmental um, giants in terms of the damage they do to, to the earth when they try to mine these things. So we have uh, researchers engaged in recycling those electronics and, and pulling out the rare earths so we don't have to mine them. Uh, so, so, so the R&D that we've got going here uh, itself will also help with things beyond net zero. Thank you, Todd. And um, if if we could stay with you on on this point and kind of expand, uh, what are your thoughts on using certificates or offsets for achieving net zero? There's this concept that especially Google has been pushing for being net zero carbon 24/7, 365 days a week, not a week, a year. Uh, and do you think that is possible and necessary uh, for your for example, INL or other organizations to achieve without offsets, without any kind of certificates. So yeah, our our uh, ultimate goal is, uh, and our our stance on offsets is for the things that we control, um, just re reduce the carbon. We're we're not going to use offsets period for scope one or scope scope two, and then with res with respect to scope three, like I. I talked about before, our real goal is to become a carbon sink and, and develop things that we can help pull carbon out of the environment period. So, so that would, um, we would see that, let, let's be our own offsetters in terms of uh, uh, getting to net zero instead of buying credits. I mean, ultimately uh, credits are fine, but somebody, organizations need to reduce their, their emissions period. Somebody has got to pay the price and get it done. So. So that's where we're at in terms of uh, credits. We're gonna try to minimize them uh, to, to the very least as possible. Well. So there may be certain safety uh, pieces of equipment for the time being, we absolutely have to have for nuclear operations or something else. Uh, if, if that's true, and I'm not completely sold that we can't <laughs> we can get by, by that either, we would potentially use credits to offset that type of emissions. But 
but our goal is not use credits or, or minimize it as best we can to get to net zero fully 365 24-7. Thank you, Todd. Um, Priya, what is your take on offsets and what are you seeing among cor corporate members of Reba? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think companies will approach their net zero commitments in a variety of ways. That's what we've seen is, you know, it could be through renewable energy purchases, investments in new technologies and business models to increase efficiencies, you know, reclaiming materials and like a whole host of other strategies. Um, you know, similar to, um, to, to, to what Todd mentioned, I think, you know, a lot of companies are, are really trying to think about how do I reduce, you know, how do, how do I reduce my carbon footprint um, and, and really wanting to drive more material impact through their direct actions. So, so many choose, what we, we see is that many choose the most impactful approaches first, um, but based on the markets in which they operate at a global level, you know, they, they may need to turn to offsets to, to neutralize whatever emissions can't be eliminated through kind of direct actions. So, so from that perspective, I think, you know, the carbon markets are an important tool to, to, um, to, to counteract truly unavoidable emissions. Um, however, you know, the, the one thing I will say is that, you know, one of the challenges that many companies face is, is the lack of standards in the carbon market. So, you know, there's high demand for, for high quality credits, um, you know, which drives up prices um, and it can be hard to compare credits. So, you know, companies may choose to invest in credits that maximize the number of tons removed, but I mean, they may not have a good sense of, you know, for, for how well that or for how long those tons will be sequestered, um, which is also equally important for actually driving towards the ultimate, you know, kind of um, goal of, of reducing climate um change and you know kind of um reducing global warming so so you know i think there are there are multiple guidelines and different verification programs and other things that exist which actually makes it a really confusing landscape um to navigate for for many companies thank you so much priya um so as we we're talking about many of these strategies um just a question and maybe we can start with stephanie of, we have slightly tackled the question of the climate crisis touches so many systems and what kind of ripple effects, whether that's positive or maybe there are some unintended consequences from us trying to um, really tackle the, the carbon emissions crisis. Uh, what do you foresee from this net zero journey? What, what can be the side effects beyond what we kind of plan for? Well, if you think about it, companies going at zero, I mean, it involves this huge transformation of our economy. And in the past, I feel like choices have been made based upon the greatest amount of money that could be made and not the greatest amount of benefit to human communities. Because climate change has created a situation where the tribe has to figure out how to build as much local resilience as possible when it comes to our food systems, our waste systems, our um, housing and infrastructure. I think redesigning things in a way that actually work for human beings and wildlife is really important to the tribe. And then also, You know, there's all these co-benefits to almost everything that one might do to restore habitat. You know, lap wave means butterfly. And it doesn't just mean butterflies. It means the sound of the flapping wings of butterflies. The community that I work in is named after butterflies. That's its place name. And there are hardly any butterflies here anymore. So changing the way that land is managed could mean bringing back those things could mean bringing back wildlife and gathering opportunities for people where they live, restoring connections to ancient trail systems. There are so many different ways to think about this. You know, beyond the, you know, economic benefits, which are 
are tre tremendous. But one of the biggest focuses of the tribe with their solar project, you know, now there's approximately 800 solar panels in Lapway and we're waiting for our, our first mega packs to be delivered is that 35 tribal members now know how to install solar here. And it's basically the only solar workforce between Boise and Spokane. All tribal members. And for many of these people, it really changed their life story, their the pro trajectory of their lives, what they're planning to do. And it's not just that, they already had a lot of construction expertise. You know, the company that we're working for or working with Revolution, they expected that it was gonna be a lot harder to train tribal members how to install solar. But the truth is that they're smart. They care a great deal about this. They already have construction skills and it was a lot easier than they thought. And there's a huge amount of interest here. There's a tremendous need for economic development in rural communities and you know, in some tribal areas, especially tribes that are in rural areas. And there's a huge opportunity for the tribe to be not only energy independent, but to change the energy landscape in this region. And, you know, that benefit of meaningful employment in the energy industry, in an energy system that reflects the values of people is incredible. I mean, that is one hopeful step towards a better world. It's not just that a solar spill is a nice day, it's that going to work on a solar project is not a dirty business. You know, it is a clean business and a hopeful future. And I think giving people hope about, you know, combating the climate crisis and helping to generate the understanding that this is something that is doable rapidly. And it really is just a matter of societal and political will is just as important as any other outcome. Because when people don't have hope, they don't act. And, you know, while people who are the captains of industry feel like they have all these tools at their disposal to make these problems better for people that maybe don't have a job, maybe are trying to figure out how they're going to get enough fish to feed their family for a year, you know, maybe see themselves as just a little tiny dot or a cog in the wheel, having hope that the forest fires are going to end, the water quality is going to get better, that base flows are going to come back, and that they can live their lives in a way that reflects their values is as important as anything. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for this powerful message. And there is so much interconnection with the climate challenge, but it's also a global problem. And I wanted to look um, a little bit at that question of how can the net zero advancement and journey in the US, because that's mostly what we're focused on, work in synergy with other countries, even though they have different policies or maybe different, different strategies, technologies. So, John, you work closely with analysts in China. Um, what is your take on working globally and across the different political or technical landscapes? Yeah, I think on this issue, the idea of U.S. leadership on climate is showing through loud and clear, right? Um, uh, because the leading companies in our geography that are declaring um, net zero commitments recognize and see that their supply chains are the real area of opportunity. I'm sure David can speak to this eloquently as well, but we work very extensively with uh, leading uh, technology companies, um, uh, leading retailers uh, in China specifically that are looking to reduce their scope three emissions and that are taking the lead on creating training and capacity building and tracking uh, uh, tools that allow them to understand within their supply chain, where can reductions flow from, how much do they cost, and where is the next investment that they should make relative to decarbonizing their overall scope three emissions. Um, so we've seen huge movement there, and it's not just restricted to China. Certainly India, Southeast Asia, these are the 
this is the reality is that these are the global manufacturing centers today and they're also where the carbon um, uh, you know footprints are growing the fastest and what we need to manage because we don't want to squeeze carbon out of the system in the United States only have it only to have it pop up twice as, as badly elsewhere in the world that would be a net loss for us all. So we've got to tackle this issue simultaneously and globally. Um, and corporate citizens are the, the best way to do this because they do span. You don't need multiple global agreements among different nations. You can have a single company project its influence through. And there's no question that China's, you know, 2060 uh, uh, carbon neutral announcement was due in part to the fact that they're in regular conversations with major companies um, like Apple and Walmart and others that are telling them this is what we need here going forward, right? Um, so so uh, I do see you know, there have been places where the United States hasn't led as effectively, but, but our corporate leadership right now and the expanding nature of these commitments has really allowed us to move faster globally to tackle these issues. Thank you, John. So, uh, David, what was your experience? And John referenced that. How, how has it been working with your supply chain members on this global issue? Yeah, well, we have one of the industry's largest su supply chains, hundreds of production suppliers, thousands of non-production suppliers. We ship over 100 million products per year. That's about 200 a minute, right, if you can imagine. Um, and now, nearly two thirds of our carbon footprint is in the supply chain. Okay, by contrast with our own operations, your typical scope one and two, that's less than 1%. And earlier on, when we were talking about is it scope three, from my perspective, and I missed out on the, the, the net zero versus carbon neutral part of the conversation a little bit, but um, I mean, it, it's all about scope three and it's not net zero if you're not really tackling scope three. So for us, it's critical that we work with our suppliers. Um, to reduce the impact of their operations and then our value chain, because after all, we've effectively outsourced our impacts to them. And if we weren't making this effort, someone perhaps, you know, less interested in having a positive impact could step in. And so John's right, it's, it's through the work that we, together with peers in our industry, um, NGOs and the like, to engage and educate and build the capacity with suppliers, but also to incentivize them. So, what well, very common tool now, but we were fairly early in developing it, was using a sustainability scorecard with our suppliers where we can incentivize them to drive ongoing and improvement. So it's essentially a score that's built around a number of environmental or social aspects, um, transparency, goal setting, performance on issues like sourcing of conflict minerals and the like. But we put that alongside and we integrated into the overall supplier procurement score, whether that's quality, on-time delivery, cost, things like that. So it's the central point of conversation for the um, for the for the supplier uh, management and the supplier relationship management manager within HP. Um, on the environmental side, so we're working to make sure that this criteria covers setting greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, production targets and making those science-based targets, committing to doing that. Third-party verification of those emissions so we can have confidence in what they're reporting as a reflection of our footprint. Publishing that in a um, in sustainability report, reporting through um, uh, mechanisms like CDP again, so that we're getting better information on emissions, energy consumption, renewable energy use, water management. Um, and then we have to support, we have to meet suppliers where they are, right? Many are, else, are different points in their journeys here. So we have to we have to bring along partners that we work with, uh, with uh, Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance on promoting renewable energy use in our supply chain in, in China. I mean, it's important that we, ha we have to take this upstream as well. Right now we can focus on our suppliers and to have, but we need them to start putting the same expectations on their suppliers, work with them, not just in our industry, honestly, but with other industries where together we're sourcing after some of the same commodities, metals, plastics, the like, investors and governments. So John's right, you know, companies can be more nimble and act in that way, but we've got to do it in conjunction with the investment community, with the NGO community and with the public sector to really bring all the right pressure points to truly drive that change upstream where it's going to be needed. Thank you so much, David.
the time is running pretty low. We were having such a fun discussion that it's I haven't even noticed how quickly it has passed. Um, so I would like to make sure that we address any of the questions that audience has. Please, if you have any question, please write them in the chat and we would really try and address them if time allows. While we're waiting for the audience to submit their questions, and please uh, feel free to submit any uh, anything that you're interested in from any of the speakers. I would have just one question as we're waiting, and that's again to David about really the impact of um, the net zero journey. There seems to be there seem, seem to be so many claims or goals towards net zero. Uh, but some people are critical that maybe that's just political, maybe that's just greenwashing, or are people just putting as marketing uh, strategy? So what is your path to know that you're really making a difference and really making a cleaner or more equitable future? Um, yeah, well, we so we reserve intentionally net zero to really reflect ultimately an end state and not to, con to confuse it what, what what I think can be you know, different ways to look at carbon neutrality, whether it's your boundaries or the, the, the manner of offsets you used or how much do you actually reduce. So I think it's going to be important for, for consumers and other stakeholders to really look through what is a company saying and what are they doing and, and really what are they disclosing. There's a, there, there's a framework that used to be AAA, now it's quadruple A. I believe it's being put forward by Ceres and We Mean Business that we're really looking to. And these four A's are number one is ambition. So setting targets based on science that are transparent and they, you know, they can be verified by external sources such as the science-based targets initiative. Number two is action, right? Actual reductions and really driving change within your business model that can demonstrate that there is true decarbonization happening. And again, it's not sort of off here to the side or, or, or largely offset based. Three is accountability, reporting and transparency and look to a lot of third parties to be sure that that's being done well. And last but not least is advocacy. So aligning your, um, your, your policy stances and advocating for positive climate uh, policies, you know, it's, this is really going to be critical because so much of what us, what we and others and all sorts of stakeholders thinking again about the tribe, what we need to change are things outside of our control. And we need to find those partners going on in, um, in, to move, you know, to drive the systemic change that's necessary. And policy is a central part of that. Thank you so much. Um, so I see there's a question from Lisa Hicht on, um, it, it's directly to Stephanie about the water energy nexus and how that concept impacts your net zero approach. Um, thank you, Lisa, for that question. Um, I'm pretty sure what Lisa is referring to is the hydropower system. I mean, it's no secret that hydropower has a huge impact on salmon and salmon populations. And, you know, one of the biggest issues at this point is that the water um, is too hot for salmon. I mean, simply put, it is just too hot for them to make their journey upriver, to complete their life cycle, et cetera. And there's a number of things, uh, about how that relates to hydropower. So first of all, you know, dams produce an incredible amount of energy in the Pacific Northwest and an inordinate amount of the supply of energy for the West. They're incredibly important for the local economy. Um, however, they were not designed with fish in mind and fish biology in mind. You know, these fish are designed to float to the ocean and to rapidly get there within a day or two and to get there on high water flows with exerting practically no energy um, of their own. They're designed to swim to get really large in the ocean. You know, in the past they would get, you know, maybe 80, 90, 100 pounds and come up river as these huge ocean creatures. Um, able to jump over barriers and get to the headwaters to um, lay their eggs. They are glacial fish. They evolved in this incredibly dynamic, melting glacial till. And that's why they have proven to be so resilient to so many dramatic changes. 
Um, so passage and flow are two huge issues for fish. And, you know, dams basically slow down and pull water and heat it up. There's just no getting around that. They also produce a huge amount of methane, incredibly. Um, and so, you know, it is the official policy of the Nez Perce tribe to remove the four lower Snake River dams. I don't think that that's any secret. Um, it's because those four dams are, you know, four dams too many for Snake River salmon. Um, they don't produce that much power. The amount of power that those dams produce could be replaced with um, solar power pretty readily, actually. Um, right now, the mitigation strategies for helping fish get downriver and upriver involve releasing water from Door Shack Dam, which is in Orofino, Idaho, and it's like a giant air conditioner for that stretch of the Snake River where it meets the Clearwater and joins the Columbia River. Um, and then to increase spill on the dams along the main stem of the Columbia River in order to help juvenile fish get to the ocean faster. I mean, obviously climate change affects every part of that journey, um, including the estuaries that they depend upon you know, this heat wave has killed an, a huge number of shellfish in the ocean. So, and affects the food, way, the food web that helps these fish get big in the first place. You know, the fish are coming back small. The journey's harder. They're finding cold water to duck into and then they're just waiting it out and starving um, instead of making it up river. So, you know, a few things that we've thrown around, idea, adaptation ideas, um, Make fish ladders work for fish. Make them more like the habitat that they depend upon them. Make them actually an attractant to fish. Have colder water coming off that fish ladder than anywhere else in the system. Um, you know, some tribes are looking at, are actually using fish packing technology to whoosh fish over the dams, like literally putting them in a vacuum tube and shooting them up over dams. Um, the Colville tribe is transporting fish around the Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee dams in order to get them into the coldest, best habitat, you know, the northern part of the Columbia River Basin that goes into Canada is where the coldest habitat will be in the future. Well, the same is true for Idaho. Idaho has some of the best habitat remaining in the lower 48, some of the coldest habitat, some of the best refugia and some of the most pristine habitat. And so, you know, the tribe's really interested in trying to get more fish to Idaho as are many other stakeholders. Um, and reconfiguring the hydro system is a part of that. I mean, the tribe just had a huge summit about this. Um, the Pacific Northwest tribes did to talk about orca and salmon and how to save these fish and the food web that they depend upon. So I think that's what Lisa is referring to. And in essence, what I would say is, you know, the model of thinking that got us into this situation in the first place, this centralized, centrally controlled energy system that is controlled by a few players who make a lot of money and the wealth of which is not necessarily distributed well, doesn't work. And we can't use the same model of thinking to get out of this problem as we used to get into it. Decentralized, locally produced energy that meets the local need and works with the ecology of the systems that it exists in, exists in make a lot more sense. You know, they say that the most important part of your house is the foundation. Well, it doesn't matter how good your foundation is if, it, if your house is in a floodplain. It doesn't matter how good your foundation is if what your house is built with burns up in a forest fire. And I think, you know, one of the most helpful things about changing our energy system is a chance to create the world that we wanna see with the lessons that we've learned from the past. And one of the most important lessons is that pe 
people being able to care for themselves with distributed food and energy systems is far, far more sustainable. And another lesson is that the more perspectives, the greater diversity of knowledge is brought to the table to solve these problems, the better off we're all going to be. And that local traditional knowledge is incredibly valuable. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And there's actually a question following on that thought of how much knowledge there is around, how many ideas there are around. And it is that we need so much collective effort and collaboration to reach net zero. And the question is about your organization strategies to capture the diversity of ideas that your employees have, that possibly some people in the, the broader community have, and then choose in between them. Um, I don't know who might, might want to speak first, but addressing how to capture the ideas and then put them into action. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to toss out a, a couple, couple of quick thoughts. So um, certainly as our strategy has now you know, grown out, uh, has, has built out and we're engaging a lot more deeper in, into the organization, we're, we're finding a lot more of that engagement and those ideas. It's necessary that our bridge is now built from out of what may have been more of a core sustainability or working with the operations team here or the transportation team here. It's now, we need to be, you know, we're engaging with finance now, we're engaging with our human resources team. We need them to be talking about it in the context of their work. We've also uh, established now for every employee has the opportunity to set an annual goal on how they can contribute to our sustainability strategy, be that climate, be that equity, a number of different things. But we really want them to be thinking, not just to, in the, we want them to think in the context of the organizational strategies, but how does their work contribute to that? And then what new ideas can they bring to the table? Um, but and we've got a lot to learn on what are gonna be some of those best ways to continue to germinate and cultivate that. Thank you, David. Any other thoughts, ideas on how to capture the ideas? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I mean, as uh, go ahead, Todd. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, as as we get rolling, um, of course, we've we've uh, got avenues like INL Net Zero uh, email address to solicit ideas that we're collecting from employees. Um, because as soon as we, as soon as John announced it, that they were immediately engaged on how how can I help, and starting to to flow ideas. The, the other nice thing is that they're thinking about at home, okay, how can I go net zero at home? So there's a ripple effect from the lab announcing it wants to do it to, for the the person, the staff's uh, home environment as well. Um, the, the other thing we're doing is, and this gets to SCO3 and our supply chain and other things is um, in September, I'm, wor I'm working on a an Idaho statewide uh, stakeholder engagement relative to net zero to get others around the state involved. And I know other national labs are doing it in their state. And then, and then we're, we'll bring it together as uh, a few of us national labs in terms of a uh, specific Northwest um, stakeholder engagement. And, and do we actually require it as part of each of our, each of our um, net zero plans to have stakeholder engagement from the employees to all the, the surrounding entities that, that we engage with as well, so. Thank you, Todd. John, you, you had something as well too, and Yeah, I was just gonna say that this, this problem in particular is, was born out of silos. It was born out of thinking and thinking about the world in increments as opposed to the whole. And if we're gonna solve it, we have to really practice radical collaboration, right? And that means, bringing together panels that are as diverse as this one, right, in terms of the different communities. That means partnering in non-traditional ways to make change happen. At RMI, we try to act as a catalyst for that. I would say Reba, you know, and Priya's work over there in part was born of a need to pull all these different companies together that wanted to purchase renewables differently and then to quickly share best practices, scale approaches, um, and make sure the whole industry was learning simultaneously. And, and as Priya indicated, 
this has created immense, enormous impact and is kind of uh, an indicator of how we can move very quickly when we collaborate and really stretch the boundaries of control to openness uh, and engagement. When we build new communities across communities, um, this is this has to be the way that ultimately we we solve this problem and and benefit from the many different ways of economic, social, um, equity, justice that are all entwined in the solution. Thank you very much, John. Well, we're already at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. I would like to thank everyone for their time participating for all the questions. Sorry if we didn't get to your question. So many interesting concepts to think about. I would like to thank all of our panelists for your time. That was incredible to have you um, speak. I, I'm just gonna offer the last minute if you had any final thoughts, something that you felt like you wanted to share and then didn't have an opportunity to. I just wanted to say that I really respect the work that all of my fellow panelists are doing. You know, the tribe is early on their net zero journey and trying to figure out those details. I mean, we've done some rough calculations and figured out that we could pretty easily get to net zero. Um, it's just organizing to do it and choosing which direction to go. But, you know, I'm coming from a hyper local perspective and I appreciated the global perspective. And I also really appreciate how hard industry leaders, scientists, researchers, and policy folks are working on this. And, um, you know, and just really appreciated John's last comment about how it takes a village. It really does take a village. And, I know that it's a village that we would all rather live in, in our future. And I know it's one that I would rather see my son grow up in. So thank you for your leadership. Um, it's an honor to be here today and represent the tribe and the tribal perspective, but it's also an honor to speak alongside all of you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for those words. And with that, we're yeah. gonna, yes, sorry. The only thing I was, I was going to say, Veronica, is we we touched base on just a small amount, but really this is an opportunity to transform the the workforce of the next generation as well. Um, I know there's there's always concern over you know the the fossil industry and everything else, but we can transform that uh, as we we move forward with next te new technologies, give them them new uh, new jobs and new things to work on, as well as what I get excited about is like uh, a couple of weeks back, we struck an agreement with our Shoshone Bannock tribes here locally to um, to develop a STEM program with them. So we're gonna be taking high schoolers, bring them into the lab to develop their capability. And I know my staff on the bio side are really, we, we wanna produce our first, uh, say PhD from the tribes in eight or 10 years, because then then you really, you're producing the thought leaders to, to get things done or across the nation as, as well as locally. So I think this is really a great opportunity to completely transform the workforce. Absolutely, thank you so much, Todd. Well, thank you all for your time. This was an excellent discussion. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to send me. This is Veronica Vashnik, like my name, at oer.idaho.gov and do not forget to submit your ideas to the case pitch competition that will be happening to help INL uh, go towards net zero. And with that, have a wonderful afternoon and a great rest of your week. Bye. Thank you. Bye.